you ready, kids? Are you ready, Captain? No. No, you're not. This game is tougher than you can imagine. Believe me, kids, you're not ready for this. You're not ready for this at all. Oh! The SpongeBob SquarePants movie is one of the rare occasions I would actually say a movie does a TV show justice. Yeah! Yeah! I'm not the biggest SpongeBob fan, but I used to watch the early episodes of the series. And while I don't really know what the consensus is from the fan community, I've always had a major soft spot for this movie. How is this possible? Let's find out. It's a wild ride and manages to be both very witty and downright stupid at the same time. Oh, my Naturally, a movie tie-in video game was inevitable. And one thing that I really appreciate about it is that it is very funny. Do you want to try a time challenge? I'm challenged all the time. There were times when I was finding the gameplay incredibly frustrating. But the constant commentary from Patrick and Spongebob rarely failed to put a smile on my face. All this running sure is making me hungry. The question is, is this nautical nonsense worth playing, or is this sponge all washed up? I can't believe this is happening here. It's horrible! The game begins in Spongebob's dream, in which he is the manager of the Krusty Krab. Talk to me, Krabs. It started out as a simple order. A Krabby Patty with cheese. So what went wrong? When the customer took a bite, no cheese! This level acts as a tutorial, in which you simply have to get accustomed to Spongebob's moves. Go Spongebob! In the beginning, you can't do very much, but you can perform a karate spin move with some foam gloves. And also wall jump by pressing the X button to propel yourself from wall to wall. You got a name? Come on, Phil, stay with me. Eventually, after SpongeBob manages to give the customer his cheese, it's revealed through a slideshow that it's all a dream. I must say that the use of these slideshows for exposition really makes the game lose a great deal of immersion. Honestly, I'd have been happy with movie clips, but this is much more stilted and jarring. So he sulks off to drown his depression in ice cream. Meanwhile, the evil Plankton hatches Plan Z, which sees him steal King Neptune's crown and frame Mr. Krabs for selling the crown to Shell City. Naturally, the task of retrieving the crown and saving Mr. Krabs falls to SpongeBob and Patrick, who we join in their, um, ice cream inebriation. Hey, buddy! Looks like this sponge is soaked. How ironic! Throughout the game, you need to use porto heads to switch between the two characters to perform unique tasks and complete various missions in exchange for Goofy Goober tokens. <laughs> These are needed to progress in the main game. You will sometimes be contacted by Neptune's daughter, Mindy, who advises that in order to progress, you need a new ability that she can only grant you if you have enough tokens. You don't have enough Goofy Goober tokens for me to give you the Sonic Wave. Wait, you want us to pay you? Don't you want your dad's crown back? Whose side are you on exactly? Patrick, you still don't have enough Goofy Goober tokens. I have some naval lint. I'm sure you do. We need two tokens in order to learn Patrick's cartwheel move. One task open to us at this stage is the combat arena, which requires you to defeat three waves of enemies. There are several of these combat arenas throughout the game, and they get progressively tougher. You might say he wiped the floor. What would you expect from a sponge? One thing about this game that I found genuinely surprising was its difficulty. To start with, I found myself repeatedly having to backtrack for Goofy Goober tokens. There were several times I reached a stage of the game when Mindy told me You'll need more Goofy Goober tokens first. The concept of needing a certain amount of items to progress is nothing new, obviously. But what surprises me is just how often this stops you in your tracks. Seriously, do not be fooled. This game is not as easy as it seems. <laughs> you need to complete various mini-game style challenges. Upsy-daisy! such as bungee challenges, simple platform challenges, and other tasks that require the use of new power-ups you learn along the way. And while these initially seem tangential to the game's narrative, you need to complete most of these to progress. Indeed, Mindy is one demanding mermaid. You need more Goofy Goober tokens before I can teach you. Oh, come on, you still want more tokens? That's one way to soak a sponge. Collecting dumbbells increases your manliness points. The bar in the top right corner indicates how many points you need before you can upgrade an ability. Both SpongeBob and Patrick have three health upgrades, and each one extends their health meters by adding an extra Krabby Patty. 
their attacks can be improved too. For example, they both start the game with similar spinning moves. <laughs> the Karate Spin and the Star Spin. When upgraded, these become macho moves that can deflect enemy attacks, which makes a great deal of the combat much easier. Patrick's Cartwheel allows you to move quickly and take down enemies at the same time, and a later upgrade increases the range of this move, taking out enemies who get too close. Anyway, as in the movie, Neptune freezes Mr. Krabs and grants SpongeBob and Patrick six days to locate Shell City and retrieve his crown. The first task is to drive the paddy wagon out of town. This is one of several driving levels and my god, the steering on this thing is diabolical. I can't say that it controls poorly, it's clearly intentional, but frustrating all the same. This thing skids all over the place and often refuses to grip the rope. Ugh, honestly, this thing is a piece of junk. Guess that's why they call it junk food. <laughs> Guess I shouldn't really be surprised by the lackluster handling considering we're driving a sandwich. Not just a sandwich, a Krabby Patty. Jeez. Collecting nitros allows you to perform a speed boost with the R1 button. Although I only recommend doing this on a long straight stretch of road, as steering this thing is hard enough as it is. Now, once you've completed a driving level, you are able to continue with your journey. If you want to reach those towers, you'll need to learn the bash move. However, since you need as many Goofy Goober tokens as possible, it's advisable to stick around to complete some driving challenges. After completing a main driving level, you then get the option to beat the time trial for another token. And if you manage to beat the time, you then get to complete a ring challenge, passing through all the rings along the road before they disappear. Yes, that's right, we're doing the ring thing again. Yeah! <sighs> you call this a challenge, Mindy? I've done this so often I could run rings around you. The final driving challenge is the manly time trial. These require you to complete the course in a ridiculously short amount of time. And they're all possible, but you need to find as many shortcuts as you can. Seriously, the time limits can be extremely tight. But at least it makes beating these time limits feel like an achievement worth celebrating. That was great driving, SpongeBob. I guess you could call that fast food. You can try and beat your best time on this road. You really are a fun sponge, aren't you, Mindy? Throughout the game, you find hidden treasure chests. These unlock extras of varying quality, shall we say. I won't discuss every single one as there are a lot, but I will mention a few. Sometimes you'll unlock costumes, such as a Mermaid Man costume for SpongeBob or a Disco costume for Patrick. My favourites are probably the plain costumes. Patrick is simply Starkers, while SpongeBob is a mere sponge. So yeah, if you want to play the game as a scouring pad, you have the option. It's a pretty funny idea. Oh no, not again. Some of the extras are sound bites taken from the game, although I'm fairly certain some of these are outtakes. Ah! What is this thing? Either way, it's kind of a strange choice. Not that it's unwelcome, I just can't imagine many players would be interested in listening to most of these. Goofy, goofy, goober, goober, yeah! There's also a great deal of concept art, which is cool. Disappointingly though, a fair few of the extras are simply the slideshow cutscenes, which really weren't all that interesting in the first place. Oh goody! Another one! Thanks, I'll treasure it. Once we have enough tokens, we can learn the bash move. With the triangle button, SpongeBob can punch things from underneath. Eventually, you can also upgrade this to a macho bash glove which sticks to objects and enemies and will detonate after a short time or by pressing the triangle button. Super In this level, Plankton has erected radio towers that are broadcasting his hypnotic messages, and it's our job to destroy them. Sorry about this evil radio tower. It's also funny to me that neither SpongeBob nor Patrick can swim and instantly drown when they touch water. Uh, yeah, uh, don't you guys live under the sea? The whole concept of water as a hazard, well, holds no water. In this level, we're introduced to the first of several sponge ball challenges. This requires you to roll around the obstacle course to reach the token. These can be very frustrating and require a lot of patience, but it actually controls very well. These challenges get progressively harder throughout the game. The last SpongeBob challenge in particular requires a hell of a lot of patience. 
The addition of steam vents makes this the most um, challenging of the SpongeBob challenges. I lost by the Saurus. But it's thankfully short. Let it be known, I did not have a ball with these challenges. The last of Plankton's propaganda towers are here on the edge of the desert. Anyway, the next level sees us having to take out the remaining towers by sliding around in a bathtub. I didn't do that. There are several levels like this referred to as sponge board levels. The idea is simply to slide to the end of the course. And like the driving levels, you're then given the opportunity to beat the time limit, complete the ring challenge, and beat the manly time limit. Here goes the pain train. As such, there are several shortcuts you can take, and sometimes during the ring challenges, rings appear in places you really aren't expecting, and you don't have much time to think. But on the plus side, they help to highlight shortcut paths, which you'll definitely need for the manly time trials. The main problem I have with these levels is that there are set paths, and it's sometimes unclear what paths you can and can't take. There were times when I saw items on alternate routes, but when I tried to change paths, the game wouldn't let me, and instead forced me in the right direction. Yeah, this doesn't wash with me, I'm afraid. Get it? Because they're in a bath? After our heroes are carjacked, they eventually find a paddy wagon in a bar parking lot. Only the key is missing, so they head inside the rough, tough bar to find it. You got it! <laughs> if you have enough goofy goober tokens, you unlock Patrick's app smash. Huh? No, really, this is what it's called. You have to be in the air for the smash to work. This move allows you to squash enemies and destroy fragile ground to open hidden areas. It can also be upgraded to temporarily daze enemies and make them see stars. Well, besides Patrick, I mean. Speaking of which, now seems like a good time to talk about some of the various enemy types. Oh God, it stinks. There are foggers who will breathe out a stinky gas. <laughs> Talk about halitosis! There are slammers, who try to squash you with a weapon. And spinners, who are difficult to hit from the side. There are also the flingers, who hover around and spit dangerous goo. And there are turret enemies, who hide in barrels and fire at you from a distance. The idea here is to fight through the angry mob and locate the key to the paddy wagon. Don't let it get away! Despite the implied urgency though, you still have to use your abilities to complete additional tasks for tokens of course. And speaking of abilities, another thing Patrick can do is use his tongue to stick to floating ice cubes, allowing him to swing across large gaps. Oh, oh. Once we've obtained the key, we can leave. But we can't get very far, as we need to drive around and collect five more keys to open the gate. I won't lie, I'm uh, low-key fed up of looking for keys. What's interesting about these driving levels is that there are several routes you can take, and a great deal of hidden shortcuts. I'm to drive my grandpa. Once we're through the gate, SpongeBob and Patrick fall for a trap. What? And it's up to Patrick to defeat the big scary frogfish. Oh, this, for ice cream. Okay. this is what I call a sea life or death situation. Surprisingly though, this is actually much simpler than you'd expect. You just have to avoid its attacks before knocking it over the edge. Now, now and again, it also tries to use its tongue to attack you, but you just have to hit it back. You might say Patrick's got this fight licked. Ha ha ha. Oh. And moving on swiftly. Next up is Rock Slide, which is, in my opinion, the worst of the Spongeboard levels, at least to complete 100%. The idea is simply to get to the bottom of the dark trench, avoiding the monsters and hazards along the path. It's still largely fun to play, but oh my god, this is honestly one of the toughest manly time trials to beat, I swear. Whee! The amount of times I attempted this level was insane. In fact, you know what? I went insane. You need to find and use as many shortcuts as you can. And it's not always clear what paths you can take. For example, there are times when a path can be seen below, but the game often decides it's too far down and respawns you. This might sound logical, but there are other times when you fall from a great height with absolutely no consequences. When Mindy said she, she wasn't kidding. 
This feels unfair. As I said before, the game clearly has set paths, but it's not always explicitly clear where these paths are. Sometimes I found a shortcut I'm not even sure I was supposed to, and sometimes I followed a certain route only to be forcibly hurled in another direction, because that's not the path the game wants me to take. Well, Sometimes this worked in my favour though. I found this shortcut towards the beginning by hopping across the lava. And the game abruptly turned me around so I was going the right way. It looked absolutely ridiculous, but hey, works for me. I think I got whiplash. Once this is done, we have to cross the trench to Shell City. Here we encounter a lot of, um, poppers. And I'm sure you'll agree, they're rather unfortunately named. These guys pop into the ground if you get too close to them, and emerge in a new location. The ability you unlock in this level is the Sponge Bowl. By holding the circle button, you can aim a bowling ball at enemies from a distance. And you can also activate these special switches. As a side note, a later upgrade makes the bowling ball cause damage to a wider range. Although besides the times when it was a necessity to use it, I rarely performed this move. You might say I wasn't exactly, uh, bowled over by it. Otherwise, this level features more of the same challenges, including another combat arena, a bungee challenge, and a floating block challenge, which simply requires you to hop across the platforms to reach the token in the time limit. Jumpy, jumper, jumper, Pretty soon, Patrick learns how to throw objects with the R1 button. Now with improved targeting! Including crates and watermelons, which are oddly plentiful in these parts. Although I'm not sure what they're doing under the sea in the first place. Uh, doesn't this technically make them underwater melons? Plankton's using those TVs to try and trick people to come to Bikini Bottom. The um, underwater melons can be thrown to destroy Plankton's TVs. They can also be used to activate faraway switches and to defeat enemies from afar. The only major drawback with this throw move is that you can't jump while carrying something, and the underwater melons randomly burst apart after some time. There's one part of this level when you need to make your way along a slippery winding pipe towards a switch, avoiding the steam vents. Slipping, slipping, slipping! And oh my god, the amount of times I attempted this was crazy. It is genuinely harder than it looks, I swear. The throw move is particularly useful for destroying Mervs, which zap you with a laser if you get too close. The name Merv is an acronym, but I can't figure out for the life of me what it stands for. I swear to god the game doesn't tell you. In some other levels, Mervs will fire rockets at you, which is really irritating as you might expect. It's so easy to get hit by these things. You might say the Mervs get on my nerves. However, it can actually be convenient for you as you can simply deflect them. Later, the throw move can also be upgraded so that Patrick can throw much further by holding down the R1 button. This does indeed improve things, although there were a couple of occasions when the game mistakenly thought I was holding the button down when I wasn't. Now and again, you also encounter something called freeze fruit. When thrown into lava, the lava will temporarily freeze. Ah! Meaning you can walk on it and find secret areas and tokens. Who are you? Your worst nightmare. A big pile of broccoli? With the TVs destroyed, Patrick then has to fight Dennis, Plankton's henchman. Hold still, you big pink idiot! Yes, once again, Patrick takes the helm of this boss fight. In spite of this being a SpongeBob game, it kind of feels like Patrick's the, uh, the star. Pun definitely intended, as usual. As was the case with the last boss fight, this is incredibly simple, as you just need to throw underwater melons at him. Or deflect the toilets that he throws at you. Have a nice trip. Ouch, that looked like it hurt. You okay, buddy? You look a little, um... Flushed. Only Goofy Goober knows the way out of Gooberland. We then need to find our way out of the amusement park in the paddy wagon. So much destruction. Yes, it's another driving level. Real talk though, despite the fact that all these levels appear to be very similar on the surface, I do appreciate that they at least try to vary them a little. Like, whereas before we had to look for keys, here we have to follow closely behind the Goofy Goober peanut man. <laughs> This is moderately difficult, especially when you reach the water slide. It's so awkward to control, and by the end of it, you're rewarded with a meager token. Is that it? All this effort for peanuts! Well done, Patrick and Spongebob. She said my name first. It's also very adorable that Patrick has a crush on Mindy, just like in the movie. 
Unfortunately for him though, it's not reciprocated. But don't worry Patrick, there are plenty more fish in the sea. <laughs> and there's a damn good reason for that. Eventually we finally reach Shell City, which turns out to be a gift shop. Using Neptune's crown, we need to slide upwards to the exit. Yes, upwards. I'm not sure how this is possible, but whatever. Petal Pan could do it, so why not? <laughs> This level isn't too bad, but it's one of the worst for the time trials. As has been the case before, it's really unclear which paths are off limits. Once again, it's like there's an invisible barrier, so it doesn't feel fair. Oh, and now and again, the uh, Cyclops will pop out of nowhere. Yeah, might want to keep an eye out for him. Once we've made our escape, we need to return to Bikini Bottom, at which moment we meet David Hasselhoff. Hey, wait! Who the hell are you? Yeah, in the movie, it was David Hasselhoff, but obviously they had to remove any kind of resemblance to him for the game. So it's just some generic man we meet on the beach, with no discernible personality. Hmm, finding a man on a beach? No personality? Sounds familiar! Prince Eric? Is that you? No mermaids around here, I'm afraid. Well, there's Mindy, uh, but between you and me, I don't think she swings that way. She likes fish. You're hot. Really though, the artists clearly spent more time on sculpting his body than they did his face. What the hell happened here? I Let me haunt your nightmares. Anyway, Plankton's henchman Dennis catches up to us. Did you miss me? And we then have a boss fight on the back of the surfer dude. <laughs> Honestly, this guy has some cheek showing his face again. And he's not the only one with some cheek. Look at his butt. Isn't it neat? Ahem. Anyway, first of all, I love the setting of this. It's very funny. And the fact that the guy has an unnecessarily hairy back just adds to the humour. But the actual boss fight itself is kind of underwhelming. SpongeBob, stop play to get back to the fight. You just have to take Dennis out with the sponge bowl. I can't say it's especially difficult, but it's just kind of dull and repetitive. Ultimately, this level's a load of hassle, without the hoff. <laughs> we then reach the level Welcome to Planktopolis, Minions. And this is insane. I'm not kidding. At this stage of the game, we encounter a huge difficulty spike. And believe me when I say it's sharp. Yeah, you might want to avoid those spikes, SpongeBob. I like to think you're porous enough. While it's been moderately challenging to collect all of the tokens thus far, this was the first time I noticed a dramatic increase in the difficulty of the main game. By this point, if you have enough tokens, you can perform SpongeBob's Sonic Wave with his guitar. This basically acts like a missile that you need to guide yourself from a first person perspective, much like the Vizzy Bomb in Ratchet and Clank, and can later be upgraded to extend its reach. This is very useful for taking out enemies or hitting targets from afar. Although it's kind of annoying that the camera doesn't immediately switch back to SpongeBob as soon as the wave has detonated. Or as soon as the wave has, um, crashed, shall we say. You can tap a button yourself to return the camera sooner, but it's a little annoying to have to do this, especially if you're already pressed for time. For example, there's one part of the level in particular that requires you to use a sonic wave while on a moving conveyor belt over a pit of lava, at the same time as avoiding some electric bolts. You heard me. Jeez, talk about overkill. Seriously, this is pure insanity for a kid's game. The amount of times I fell into the lava was insane. With the sonic wave, there are also some challenges that require you to guide the wave through timed rings. And this can be very trial and error. The worst of these is in the level Shell City dead ahead, as the rings often just seem to appear off the trail without warning. It takes several attempts to actually figure out what direction the path of rings is taking you, and hitting just one obstacle means you have to start over. Further into Planktopolis, we also encounter a number of extremely intense wall jump sequences. There are several wall jumps you need to perform while the walls themselves are moving, all with additional hazards to avoid. I think what could have made this easier is the addition of shortcuts or more checkpoints. Put one foot wrong and you need to climb from the very bottom all over again. It's incredibly frustrating. And things don't get any easier when we get to the final rooms of the temple. As soon as I arrived in this room, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. A huge bed of spikes and no clear way around it. Considering how far apart the walls are, I thought surely I don't have to wall jump here. Do I? Oh contraire. 
I know it's a lot to absorb, little sponge, but that's exactly what you have to do. Yeah. I also want to add that finding one of the challenges here was incredibly difficult. Towards the end of the level, there's a very easily missable button hidden behind a wall. Activating this is what unlocks the final sponge ball challenge. Just finding the challenge is a challenge, let alone the challenge itself. As a side note, in light of the overly challenging nature of this level, the developers added an ultimate combat arena here. Occupied by one solitary jellyfish, you simply have to slap it away and you win a token. Honestly, I love the sense of humour of this game. Adding this patronisingly easy combat stage here is both pretty funny and a welcome respite. Speaking of which, the final section of the temple is also pretty intense. The enemies bombard you relentlessly as you make your way to the centre platform. Once you make it to the final conveyor belt, you need to use the sonic wave to destroy the plankton statue. Plankton, there's nowhere left to run! You're too late, SpongeBob! King Neptune is already at the Krusty Krab too. He's all set to fry crabs and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> we then reach Drive of the Knucklehead McSpazitron. Sorry, that's Drive of the Knucklehead McSpazitron. Oh my god, I've been censored. It's a pain in the butt being able to be able to be politically correct. In this level, we need to make our way to the Krusty Krab too. You've got enough Goopy Goober tokens for me to bring back the paddy wagon. I do? Oh, that's great! Yes, well, I, I can't really echo that sentiment, but whatever. The idea is simply to race to the restaurant before the roads get blocked by falling debris. No! This then transitions to the final boss against the brainwashed Neptune. All hail Plankton! This final fight is far more difficult than I expected, especially considering how generic and simplistic the previous boss fights were. <laughs> The idea is to avoid Neptune's attacks and rotate all of the tables. Then you need to hide behind Mr. Krabs to lure Neptune into zapping you, thus deflecting his attack. With Neptune dazed, you then need to use the sonic wave to inflict damage on him. You got him with that one. Neptune's attacks become increasingly difficult to avoid, and it gets even worse when the floor collapses and enemies spawn. Honestly, I can't overemphasize just how intense this is. It really is a challenge. But hey, what would you expect from a final boss? At the very least, as soon as the floor gives way, the game actually gives you a checkpoint, which I was extremely grateful for. And to add to the awesomeness, the latter part of this fight is accompanied by the Goofy Gooba rock song. I'm Goofy Gooba! In more ways than one, this fight rocks. Once this is over, we are treated to one last boring slideshow. SpongeBob and Patrick, you have performed a manly deed. I'm so proud of you. But if you find all of the tokens in the game, you're treated to one final montage of SpongeBob at the Krusty Krab. It's not much, but hey, at least it's something. But remember I mentioned the treasure chests you need to find to unlock the extras? Hey! Seriously, it is rare that I do this, but I had to resort to using a walkthrough. No! I'm so sorry, guys. I had no choice but to throw in the sponge. Really, some methods of finding these chests are ridiculously obscure, and I'm gonna mention a few that I had no shame in looking up. One of the most obscure chests is in the level Shell City dead ahead. There are three large toasters hidden across the level. You need to hit all three of them to lower the toast into the toasters. The first one is easy enough to find, although I'm not sure why you'd think to throw a watermelon at a big toaster in the background in the first place. The remaining two toasters are situated towards the end of the level, meaning you then need to traverse the entire level without dying. Every time the level reloads, the toasters are reset. This is particularly annoying when you've got this part to get through. Just like walking on ice cream. Although it's much easier with the upgraded throw. All the same, I still wouldn't call this an easy task. One of the toasters can be found during the Sonic Wave challenge, and is extremely easy to miss. And the last one is also accessed using the Sonic Wave, as it's way over in the background. Hitting all three toasters makes a chest appear, because of course it does. That makes perfect sense. In the driving level, Drive of the Knucklehead McSpazitron, I was missing one chest and again had to resort to a walkthrough! The horror! Towards the end of the track, there's a wall you break through. 
and the chest is then found behind you. Considering you're timed in this level, it's extremely unlikely that you think to backtrack. Placing a chest here just seems downright unfair to me. And in the level 3000 miles to Shell City, destroying all these floating boxes at once seems to make a chest appear. This one also feels unfair. And the final chest I struggled with was in the level Bubble Blowing Baby Hunt. It turns out that you simply need to defeat all of the secret enemies that pop out of wooden barrels. As soon as I disposed of them, another wooden barrel burst, revealing the chest much further in the level, which I then had to make my way to. It wasn't especially difficult to obtain once I knew how to make the chest appear, but seriously, why would you think to do this? It feels totally random. Hey! What's especially disappointing is that the final extra to unlock is merely a slideshow cutscene. It would ironically be easier to just complete the final boss to watch this scene than to go to the effort of finding these chests. Okay, anyway, it was a challenge and I did wind up using a walkthrough, but hey, I still feel pride in having completed everything. <laughs> That's what I call a clean sweep. Kind of fitting for a sponge. The manliness has landed. This game is far more challenging than you'd expect. Obtaining the tokens is not what I'd call easy. The driving and sliding levels, for example, require you to utilize as many shortcuts as possible. The recurrence of time trials and ring challenges, and the trial and error nature of these missions can make it feel repetitive. Although I have to say, I never really found it boring. <laughs> And once you get to Planktopolis, the difficulty spike is insane. Really, this is one of the toughest movie games I've completed in recent years. But while I do question why a Spongebob game is so challenging, I don't think its difficulty is any reason to be critical of it. If anything, it makes it a memorable experience. And it certainly doesn't detract from the fact that this game is surprisingly well made. What I would criticise is the obscurity of some of the treasure chests, the lacklustre slideshow cutscenes, and the unclear layout of some of the sliding levels, especially the rock slide level. But ultimately, these are rather minor issues when you consider just how much is packed into this game. This is one of the most well-made movie games I've played in recent times, not to mention one of the most challenging and rewarding. It's just a shame that some of the chests give you peanuts. <laughs> Hey everyone! There was so much to say about this game and it was one of the best I've played this year. I've only just begun to realise that the Heavy Iron Studios movie games are mostly very good. They also developed The Incredibles and Scooby-Doo Night of 100 Frights, both of which were unexpectedly solid games in my opinion. Not only is the gameplay compelling in all of these games, but the attention to detail is excellent. Even in the backgrounds of this game, you can see little easter eggs, like Sandy on the wheel, just like that scene in a movie. And even though Squidward doesn't appear in the game, his and SpongeBob's houses can be seen in the background as the game begins, which is a really nice touch. They really know how to capture the vibe of the movie. I love it. Anyway, once again, shout out to channel member and patron 3Spooky5Me and my other current patrons, Anthony Gallagher, Eagle Weege, Volico72, and Matthew Shaw. A deleted scenes compilation will be on its way soon. And thanks also to my free Patreon members, Hannah Kingdon, Michael Shields, Dennis, GamerKid96, and Mood Fike. If you want a shout out, or you just want to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron or a channel member yourself. Details are in the description as usual. In any case, your views, likes, and attendance at the premieres mean a hell of a lot. So a big thank you to everybody. This year has gone from being an unexpected revival year for the channel to being the best year of the channel ever. I'm extremely grateful. I'm already working on the next review right now. So I'll see you again soon. Bye bye for now. <laughs>